In the fourth year of my PhD, I adopted a knowledge management system that, and this is not an exaggeration, revolutionized my research and writing. Previously, I had taken all of my notes on paper, in the margins of books, or in a variety of notebooks with very little to no organization of the notes and the thoughts that I was having. So it was all an absolute mess, and it was a mess with very little internal structure. Now, the knowledge management system that I currently use in my PhD is still a mess on the surface, but if you are going to be a thought worker, I don't think there's any way you can avoid the mess, really. We're, we're taking in information from all different places at all different times, and we cannot organize that incoming information in a top-down way. We can't force the world to give us information in the way that we want it, nor should we want to dictate how the information should be organized, because an insight that I gather over here might be just as relevant over here. And if I have forced that insight into a little box over here, it's going to be a lot harder to retrieve and apply over here. So instead, with the Settlecaston system of knowledge management, we can slot information into our brains in a kind of self-organizing way because of the philosophy that we apply to building our knowledge. I made a whole video on this system and I encourage you to watch it because it is still very relevant to this video here. However, I demonstrated how I use this technique in a digital system, specifically using the software Obsidian, and today I want to talk about how you can make this system with straight up a paper and pen. Settlecaston trans translates from the German to mean slip or note box. And of course the original Settlecastons were actually built in boxes full of slips of paper. Some people still prefer that method today and I completely understand. Physical pieces of paper is a much more hands-on system and we get the added benefit of like a more spatial understanding of our knowledge, which is super interesting. Here on YouTube, Scott Shepard's YouTube channel is totally dedicated to what he calls an anti-net Settlecaston to differentiate the physical Settlecaston from the digital one, which has kind of been taking over the entire space. So if you want more in-depth knowledge from someone that actually has a physical knowledge management system, you could head over to Scott Shepard's channel. However, I also wanted a video about this on my channel because I want this system to be used universally. I think it's great for everyone, but I don't necessarily think computer software is great for everyone. And I know some people in my audience are going to prefer the paper and pen method. So what I've done is just turned some of my digital notes into physical notes and made myself a tiny baby Settlecaston system to demonstrate it to you, what I think that I would do if this was my system. And I will say it was so fun. Part of me wishes that I did have a physical system because it's just so pretty and enjoyable to work with these cards, but ultimately a digital system is so much more efficient and effective for me. All right then, let's get to business. There are four things that you will need to adopt a physical Settlecaston system. Thing number one is paper. Any small uniform paper will do, so you could cut up pieces of paper yourself, or like me, you could purchase little index cards from any office supplies store. Thing number two is a writing utensil. Again, you can use any writing utensil, but keep in mind these pieces of paper are small, so you want it to be something that can write finely, and you want these to last for basically ever, so you don't want something that'll smudge like a pencil, or something um, that is not waterproof, like for instance, since the ink I use in my fountain pen is not waterproof, something that will last and that can write in a fine way. Thing number three, a box. Again, almost any location will do to store your pieces of paper, but preferably the location is a similar size to the pieces of paper so that you can flip through them easily. Hopefully it's not too deep. This box that I found, um, I actually inserted something in the bottom to lift the cards up a bit because it was a bit too deep and it made flipping through the cards a bit difficult. And then also if you want your system to be portable, then your box should have a lid of some kind. And as your system gets bigger, your box will also have to grow. And thing number four that you will need to adopt a physical Settlecaston is a guiding philosophy, and that's what we're going to start with today. The core principles from my previous video on this topic still stand, but there are some specificities for the physical system, so it's worth repeating them here. The first guideline is to write all the time. Writing is integral to this system. We use writing to document things, but also to understand what we think about things and discover 
cover our own thought. Because my Tzettelkasten is on the computer, I, you know, will go out and I'll be writing things down in a notebook or on little note cards or whatever, and then when I get home, I translate those fleeting notes into permanent notes in my system. However, if you are adopting a physical system, you could just carry these little note cards with you everywhere you go and be translating your fleeting notes or thoughts into permanent notes on these cards while you're out and about, which I think is very cool. The only thing is that you wouldn't want to label them yet because you don't have your physical system, which presumably is at your house. So essentially you would name your note and write your permanent note and then you'd give it a label and slot it into your system when you got home. So principle number one is to carry these little cards everywhere and write down everything you're thinking and everything that you want to remember. Guiding principle number two is that anything can be knowledge. As in a digital system, in a physical system, the Tettelkasten doesn't prioritize any knowledge source over any others. There is no piece of knowledge too small to put into your system or too silly to store there. You never know what will be useful when. So again, write all the time and write about everything that you notice or find interesting or think you might be able to use or even don't think you might be able to use because who knows. The difference with a physical Tettelkasten though is that the system is linear, so it does look like some things come before other things. This is mostly an illusion. It doesn't, in the end, matter where you slot each card. And Lumen actually wrote in his piece, Communications with Settlecastons, which has been translated by Sasha on the Settlecaston forum, I'll leave a link below. He wrote, you must give up the assumption that there are privileged places notes of special and knowledge ensuring quality. Each note is just an element that gets its value from being a part of a network of references and cross references in the system. So write it all down, don't place any special value on any one note. Guiding principle number three is that notes are irreducible complete thoughts, and this is even more obvious on a physical system because you only have so much space to take your note. So your thought should be complete in and of itself, it should be short, and it shouldn't be multiple thoughts, it should be irreducible. This should be able to stand on its own and be understandable as you flip through and read notes, finding the one that you need. Lumen wrote, you should only write on the front side of the paper slips so it is possible to read the note during searches without the need to take it out. That is how small the thought should be, it should fit on one side of a piece of paper. Now, I don't totally agree with this. I think that you you could extend onto the back. Maybe you want to staple a second piece of paper there. I think that there are tactics you could use if you want to take longer notes, but as a rule of thumb, that's a great place to start. And guiding principle number four is that knowledge is interconnected. When writing and inserting a note, you should always ask yourself, how might I want to find this thing again? And then you should file it in every way that you can imagine answering that question. So put it after the note that logically comes before it. Add stickies and things to tie it to specific projects. Add references to other notes and to bibliographic information where you might need it. Develop sort of cards that act as an index or a hub note of many topics so that you can find this thing again. This is how you will ensure that you can find the right knowledge at the right time because it is contextualized by all of the other notes within your system. And in a physical system, this is particularly important to remember to do as you are inserting every note to connect it to other notes because you don't just have um, a built-in search function the way that Obsidian does. So if you apply these four concepts, writing is thinking, anything could be knowledge, thought is the basic unit of knowledge, and thought must be interconnected, then you will have a knowledge management system that not only helps you remember and use your knowledge, but actually thinks with you and offers up surprising connections at relevant moments. As Lumen wrote, similar to our own memory, in a Tettelkasten, there is no pre-planned comprehensive order, no hierarchy, and surely no linear structure like a book. And by that very fact, it is alive independently of its author. The entire note collection can only be described as a mess, but at least it is a mess with a non-arbitrary internal structure. So with all those things in mind, Let's get messy. Here is my little makeshift Tettelkasten box. This front section of the box is my permanent notes. That's the Tettelkasten itself. And then this little back section I've just made for bibliographic notes. This box is what one of my Starbucks mugs came in and I thought it was just like the perfect size, almost. I did put this brown cardboard into the bottom 
uh, just from a takeout container. And then I also turned the takeout container into this little back section. Eventually you'll probably want a two boxes, one for your bibliographic notes and one for your main Settlecaston notes. But it's so tiny right now that I figured I would just use this one box for both. I'm gonna start this video by showing you the order that I took these notes in. I just pulled them straight out of my digital Settlecaston, but I did it to imitate the way that I might actually take notes in a physical Settlecaston. So let me just separate these out for a second. So I started with this note called academic humility. And to start things off, in my system that I've created, each note has a title, a unique identifier, the body of the note, any sources highlighted in yellow that the note is referring to, and then I've used these green lines just to denote the beginning and the end of the permanent note, and then anything under here is going to be connections and references to other notes. So because this is the first note in my system, I've called it 1A. Some people I've seen have determined in advance what subject each number is going to correspond to in their Tuttlecaston. So for instance, if I was in school and I had my DRAM 100 class, I might decide that all the ones are what I'm learning in my DRAM 100 class. And there's nothing totally wrong with that, but I prefer a more sort of like organically emerging topic structure. And so I haven't made the number one note yet because I don't fully know what this section is about yet. I've made the number one A note. Ultimately, it doesn't matter to me what that note is. It matters what builds up behind it. So one A is academic humility. It says, according to this source, academic humility is acknowledging that anyone can teach us something. And whenever I write a quote, I put it in quotes and I put how to find that source again. And that was my for first note. On the back of that note, I have my references to other notes in my system. So when I first took this note, this part didn't exist. It was only until later when I started adding notes in my system that I could actually link to them. But for instance, you might have things like, oh, academic humility in the sciences and then there's all the notes that are related to that, or academic humility in the arts, everything related to that. How to achieve academic humility, all of the things related to that. So you can start to see why these unique identifiers are extremely important. They tell you where to put the note in your system, and then they offer you a quick and easy way to refer specifically to that note on other notes. And this is how you're gonna start building knowledge and like webs of knowledge and how you're gonna be able to use this knowledge. This idea came directly off of my first 1A idea and the thing that comes after 1A is 1B. So 1B says academic knowledge comes from any source and you always want the titles of the note quite clear at the top of the page so that when you're flipping through your box, you can see it very quickly and easily. I've also highlighted the actual unique identifier of this note because that is sort of like the most important thing that I'm looking for. If I see that how to achieve academic humility is found on 1A1, then I want to quickly and easily be able to identify 1A1 in my system and I know that it's gonna be the highlighted in pink part. This one has another source in it that it's referring to. I've highlighted those in yellow so that I know that that is a note. And then in my bibliography, I have a corresponding yellow highlight with the part of the title of this bibliographic note that is relevant or is linked to. So let's take a look at a bibliographic note. So this note is referring to Bouchard et al from 2013. This is some article that I read when I was preparing to write a paper. I put the author's name, the date, and the article title. Now, the author's name was like really long because it's many, many people. So I also put the author's names down here, all of them. I would include a synopsis if this was my real system. I put where it's published and the uh, number and volume. Uh, another good example of a bibliographic note, and these are in um, alphabetical order by author name, would be I just finished reading the book Wandering Souls by Cecile Penn, which was just published this year. I wrote her name, the date, and the title of the book at the top. And then I put when I finished the read because I'm interested in that. I put my rating of the read because again, I'm just interested in that. And then I put a synopsis of the book. I included the names of the characters, which I know I'm gonna wanna remember um, what they were doing in the book and that it was long listed for the Women's Prize in 2023. And then on the back, I included a notable quote and I might include a couple notable quotes. This is one instance where if I don't think that I'm going to like link to this book a lot because it's just a work of fiction and maybe I didn't take so many notes on it, I just read it and I want to remember that I read it and that's it, then I might actually 
take a stapler and staple another card to the back of this note so that I can continue my synopsis if I really want to remember the entire summary of the note. And that would be like my alternative to a reading journal. Anyway, let's go back to the main notes now. There's one B. One C, again, was kind of directly off of that. It's called Denaturalized Books as Research Dissemination, which is related to the idea that academic knowledge can come from any source. Well, it can also become any source. And then 1D, Dialogue Between Academics is Research Dissemination. So again, going directly off of the previous one, well, Dialogue Between Academics is not a book, therefore it is Denaturalizing Books as Research Dissemination. And those were the first four notes that I made. By that point in time, I had a pretty good understanding of this type of note that I was making here. It definitely seemed like it had something to do with academic research, and so that is the general topic that I am calling one. So now I know that all the ones have something to do with academic research. So in the distant future, when I go to put a note into my system and it has something to do with academic research, I'm gonna pop right over to my academic research section and I'm gonna see if there's any relevant notes to put this new note behind. Speaking of which, I did have some more note ideas that might be relevant. So later on, I had the idea that if you have a diversity of hobbies, you're more likely to be humble as an academic. And that idea came right after this idea of academic humility. So I wanted to put it in between 1A and 1B. So I'm using a number letter alternating system. So this new note is gonna be called 1A because it's directly related to this note. And then I'm gonna add a one next to it. 1A1, having diverse hobbies develops academic humility. From that, I had another idea which was related to hobbies. I said that hobbies makes your thought more innovative and I called that 1A2. So that's going right after the 1A2. One. So now if I wanted to write something that's only related to 1A1 and not really 1A2, then I would go 1A1A and so on. If I wanted to put something between 1A and 1A1, well, there's already a number letter number sequence here. So how would I do that? I think there's a variety of ways. You could start implementing something like a dot or a dash or a slash and then start your whole system over again. Or you could put something in front of the 1A so that it might be like 1.1A 1 1 and then you would slot that in between. So whatever makes sense for your own system is what you should do, whatever you're going to remember that you did. And now there is our whole one section for now. So I'm gonna slot that into my box and I put a little sticky note with the number one on it right on top of this first note so that it's very easy to find the one section when I go to my Zettelkasten. You'll also see that I'm using this first note as a kind of hub note so that I can find everything in section one. So the notes that are on research dissemination right now are notes 1C and 1D. And as I develop more topics in my academic research section, I'm going to add more topics here, kind of like an index at the back of a book. And then I can just look at this one note to search through this whole section instead of flicking through all of them. And then of course, in exactly the same way, I went to make my next section. My next card is the two section. So 2A is Anthropocene, makes us see humans as equal to non-human. I have what this note is about. I have a little quote from my source where I got this idea. 2B is called English doesn't support equality between humans and non-humans. Again, I have a source which I didn't highlight and so it's hard to see, but there, it is, and so that source is gonna be in my bibliographic notes. To see writers have responsibility to trees that died for their paper, it's got the same uh, source there. And you'll see I didn't have enough space on the front of the note, so I continued it on the back, and then I've got the green line to denote that my note is actually over. And then I've started my little index on the back of the cards of related notes. For instance, reducing paper in research was something that I kind of talked about in 1C and 1D, so Let's just flip through here, find one C and, and D. There they are. So if we denaturalized books as research dissemination, yes, that would reduce paper. And if we treated research dissemination as dialogue, again, that would reduce paper that we're using in the academy. So it was pretty easy to find those notes based on the connections I wanted to make. Let's go ahead now and start a project, like a writing project, where maybe I want to write about this topic because I just had this idea when I made this note because I had already made these notes. My concept for project management within a physical Zettelkasten relies on these little sticky tabs. So I'm gonna pick a color. Let's pick green because this is kind of about the earth and trees. And I'm just gonna stick it right on the edge there so that it's popping up. 
and I'm gonna do that on each card that is related to this particular project. If this card, for instance, is related to more than one project, maybe I've got a blue project on the go as well, I can just toss another sticky note there and I can use it in both the blue and the green project. So I can have like right now up to, you know, six projects on the go. And whenever I'm searching through my Tettelkasten for those projects, I'll know where they are because they have the green sticky note on them. So I'm gonna collapse section two and section one and we're gonna see what that looks like in the box. I've called section two people and the planet because that seems to be the topic that is emerging here. And then I'll make an index on the front of the card, of course. And this is gonna be easier to maneuver as you get more cards in the system because they won't be falling over like they are in my case. And let's toss a section three in there just so that you can see what I've done here. So I've staggered the sticky notes, so it's very easy to see sections one, two, three, etc. When I'm looking for a specific number of card, it's very easy for me to flip to that section and look through only that section. And then if I'm working on a specific project, I'm gonna go through here and say I'm working on the green project, I'm just going to pull out every green sticky and uh, work on those. And you don't really have to worry about these getting kind of like messy um, outside of your system because they're numbered. It's very obvious where you're gonna put these back in the system later. So if they get all shuffled up, like it doesn't really matter. Um, it just might be time consuming to put back later depending on how many green stickies are in your project. The second last thing that I'll say is I also use the back of bibliographic notes as a place to store indexes of information where I reference those books or things that are relevant. For instance, Natalie Loveless gave a talk that I attended called Why Research Creation back in like 2021. On the front, I've got, you know, where the conference happened and I'll have a little synopsis of the conference. And then on the back, I have a list of cards that reference this topic because I'm not going to take all of my notes about this conference on this card. This card is just a placeholder that I can refer to the source so that I can get the bibliographic information. I can get a brief synopsis of it to see if it's relevant. On the back, I'm going to refer to all the other places that mention this talk. So my notes about this conference are actually gonna be scattered throughout the system as those permanent irreducible notes. And then the last thing that I wanna say is make it fun, make it your own. I've added colored stickies, I've added colored highlighters. You can add some washi tape, you can put stickers on your notes. Do whatever it is that's going to make this a fun activity for you. It could be fun forever. This is your conversation partner. This is your second brain. This is where all of your knowledge lives and where you get all of your ideas and how you write the first drafts of all of your papers. Like, it should be fun. So that is how I would start if I was going to build a physical Tettelkasten and it's not totally off the table for me. I might want to adopt something like this when I do say a book project or something like that for a specific project my life. I am also right now building up a series of blog posts on the blogging platform Medium, so if you want to get a sort of longer form text-based introduction to the Settlecast and system, then you can head over to my Medium, I'll link it below. If you're not on Medium, all of my articles are behind a little paywall, so if you pay one price for the year um, or month by month, then you can access every article on Medium's platform. It's very inexpensive. I think it's totally worth it. If you want to get that through my link below, that would also help me out. But of course, all of this information is or will be available for free on my YouTube channel as well. So you can search through my other videos on the topic to figure out how to use a Settlecasten. Best of luck in your knowledge management journeys, everybody. And please feel free to send me pictures of your physical Settlecastens. I would absolutely love to see them or comment below how you use this system differently than I imagine I would. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video soon.